cross. It was meant to horrify the world. It was meant for humiliation. It was meant to last for days. It was meant for slow asphyxiation. It was meant to prolong torture. It was the Roman soldier's job. It was meant to be used by Caesar, but instead it was used by God. It was meant to stop a movement, but instead it became the way. It was meant to act on fear, but instead it awakened faith. It was meant to be vicious and violent, but instead it became our peace. It was meant to uproot hope, but instead it became the seed. It was meant to punish captives, but instead it unleashed freedom. It was meant to build up Rome, but instead it built God's kingdom. It was meant to discourage rebels. It was meant to stop insurrection. It was meant to put down Jesus, but instead it set up his resurrection. It was meant to jeer and mock him, but instead it was his glory. It was meant to erase a chapter, but instead it became the story. It was meant to hold up convicts, but instead it raised up a king. It was meant to shut our mouth, but instead it's why we sing. It was meant to be a judgment, but instead it became our mercy. It's why the song of heaven is the lamb. The lamb is worthy. It was meant to kill an enemy, crush dissenters and diversion, but instead it became the banner of God's love for every person. It was meant to be appalling, nailing hands and feet to wood. It was meant to be used for evil, but instead it was used for good. It was meant to be a symbol of God's assassination, but instead it became the symbol of Jesus' invitation. Come to the cross. Instead of sin and stain, you are meant to be made clean. Instead of being forgotten, you are meant to know your sin. Instead of being ashamed, you can leave behind your guilt. Instead of feeling empty, you were meant to be fulfilled. Instead of being broken, you are meant to be made whole. Here, Calvary is calling. It beckons you. Behold, come to the cross. Instead of being an accident, you have a purpose and a plan. Instead of being abandoned, you were chosen by his hand. For all who've said, I can't, God has said, I can. No matter what you've done, the invitation stands. Come to the cross. Instead of being doubtful, you are meant to know your father. You are meant to be his son, and you are meant to be his daughter. You were cherished from the start. You are always in the picture. Instead of being a victim, you are meant to be a victor. The result of Jesus' blood, salvation has arrived. Instead of being dead, you are meant to be alive. cross. It was meant to signal death, but instead it's a sign of living. It was meant to be the end, but instead it's our beginning. Good morning, happy Easter, Northridge. We're so glad that you're here. We have so much to celebrate today. 
Lift up your voice, celebrate with us. I would be hopeless without your goodness. I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness if it wasn't for the cross. You have won me with your kindness. Chase me down when I was lost. If he wasn't for the cross, hallelujah, thank you Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, cause with your blood you bought my freedom.
Thank you, Jesus. I was a prisoner. Now I'm not. With your blood, you, you bought my freedom. Hallelujah. For the cross. When I am lost, when I am guilty, I look to the cross and I see you, the Son of God hanging there for me. The spotless lamb perfect sacrifice can't comprehend why you gave up your life but I see you. the son of God hanging there for me I will look to the cross to see Jesus you Dead is paid, my stains are gone. You made a way when it seemed our hope was lost. Crucified, you laid down your life. You were beaten, broken, spies. Buried, but now. sacrifice can't comprehend why you gave up your life but I see you the son of God hanging there for me so I will look to the cross to see Jesus you
Yes, you were buried, but now you're alive. Amen, amen. He's alive. God, we thank you so much for the power of the cross and the freedom that comes with the stone being rolled away and the tomb being empty. We thank you for the privilege to stand here this morning and serve and worship and praise a risen Savior. Thank you for the power of this day that 2,000 years later, God, we can still celebrate, that people are still gathering to celebrate the most important event in history. In your name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Have a seat. Happy Easter to you. We are so thankful that you have chosen to come out and be with us uh, today to celebrate uh, really the greatest event in all of history. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely worth it uh, for sure. Uh, hey, listen, I just want to say, first of all, welcome home. And one of the things I think is cool about saying that today is that it's really through what Jesus Christ did on the cross and it's through his resurrection that we're able to, to, to look out at a group of people who are very different in all kinds of ways, and yet we're family. Uh, and, and it's because of him. And so I just want to say welcome home. And if you've never experienced that kind of community, that kind of family, like you're in the right place today. So thanks for being here. Uh, I just want to encourage you to take one little step, one little step that will kind of get you just a little deeper into the family today. And that is to take this connection card, either on your seat or the seat back in front of you, and fill it out this morning. And here's what I want to do. I want to encourage everybody to fill it out today. I know we don't usually do that, but it's a great way for us just to make sure our records are up to date. For those of you that are here all the time, uh, for those of you that are new here, it's a great opportunity for us to sh just shoot you a little information back about the church, see if you have any questions. Uh, we're not going to hound you or pester you or anything like that. Uh, and so let's just all do that this morning. This card is also really, really valuable for several other reasons. Uh, first of all, if you want to take any next steps this morning spiritually, maybe you're interested in baptism. Uh, we're having baptisms next week. Uh, maybe uh, this morning, like somebody invited you here or you came with family because you drove in from out of town or something. And like this whole thing is not really your thing. But today might be the day that you say, hey, I'm not committing to this thing, but I got some questions. I'd like to have some questions answered. Even if you're from out of town, hey, we can email you. We can call you. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you, whatever those next steps are this morning, this is a, uh, and there's some boxes for that, but you can write on the back, you can make up your own next step. <laughs> here's, here's what I'd like help with. Uh, and so just any of that kind of stuff today, just want to encourage you to take advantage of this. Maybe you got a prayer request, put it on there. The staff will sit down and pray over your request. So listen, every week we want to take a moment in the middle of our service because we, we think that generosity is such a huge part of the Christian life. Um, and we also think that it's really a part of our worship. And so we take a moment just to talk about that for a second and just, just ask God to bless uh, the, 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 the gifts that, 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 uh, that, that we give uh, to, to, to push uh, his kingdom further uh, here in our area and around the world. And so I just want to take just a moment uh, to, just, to just talk about um, generosity. Uh, first of all, again, this weekend is a great day to talk about, uh, a great weekend to talk about it because nobody's more generous than God is, right? Like he sent his son yeah, absolutely. He sent his son uh, to give his life for us when we didn't deserve it. And so that, that, the, that generosity and that sacrifice is incredible. But there's a verse in Proverbs that says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. And I love that. Like, that doesn't mean that like you're going to be like rich in material things, that you're going to be super wealthy because you're a generous person. But I think what it means is, first of all, God knows what you need. He's going to take care of that. Uh, but then also, here's what I think. I think it's the richest way to live life uh, is, is to be a generous person. And so I just think it's an amazing opportunity that we have every Sunday and throughout the year to support uh, what God has been doing through Northridge since 2008 at this campus and the other campuses since then uh, as well. And so there's three different ways that you can, that you can uh, join with us in that mission. Uh, you see there you can give online at nrcc.church slash give. Uh, you can give on the Church Center app or the, the, the connection card box, the little uh, black box by the door as well. Or you can scan that code and that will take you to one of those as well. And so uh, we just want to encourage you to, to jump on board with what God's doing and experience what it means to be a generous person and live that rich lifestyle uh, that, uh, that God offers us as we follow his amazing example. So let's just take a moment to pray 
over that. And then uh, Johnny's going to come and wrap up our extraordinary, our extraordinary Nobodies of the Bible series. And it's an amazing, amazing, amazing wrap up. So I'm just really excited for you to hear it. Let's take a moment to pray. God. Thank you so much for your generosity to us. Thank you that we have an opportunity uh, to be a part of your kingdom and the work that you're doing here on earth through our generosity as well. Um, God, I just pray that we would see that as, as part of our worship. And not to try to, like, pay you back, but as an as a opportunity to be more like your son, as an opportunity to, 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 for you to work more in our lives and for us to be more and more open to what you're doing in our lives. And, and and, and so, God, I just pray that you would bless what's given today. I, press, I, I pray, God, that you'll continue to help Northridge to go forward with the mission. I pray, God, that uh, you will continue to make a, a massive difference uh, overseas, that we'll continue to make a massive difference here in our own community as well. God, use us for your glory. God, we, like, our passion is to see your kingdom spread, to see movements ignited throughout this area and all areas as well. And so, God, I pray that you would continue uh, to use us as we press forward to those big goals. In Christ's name we pray. Well, good morning, church. Happy Easter. How we doing? Everybody excited to be here today? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, we are, like Jim said, we are wrapping up a series. We're, we're landing it today on Easter Sunday, and we've kind of been in this series where we've been talking about, it's been neat, it's, it sparked a lot of conversations, uh, had one between services today, uh, about how you just don't ordinarily talk about these people, because this whole series has been about people that have played extraordinary roles in the story of God bringing redemption to planet Earth and to the people of Earth and, 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 and the whole entire world, but they don't, they're not usually the front runners, right? They've played extraordinary roles. If you've been around here for the last few weeks, you know, we, we've talked about people that maybe you've never even heard of, and they've played extraordinary roles in the kingdom of God, but they're not really making the headlines. And so we've bypassed some heavy hitters like Moses and Joseph and Paul and Peter and those people did amazing things. And we've been focusing in on some people that have played a little bit of the story in the background, in the background. And so if they're not making the headlines, what's the headline for today? What's the Easter story headline? Well, here it is. It's a really long headline, but it's a headline. After a ton of ministry in a short time, Jesus goes to the cross, dies on the cross, is taken down, Put in a tomb. A large stone was then rolled in front of that tomb. He's in there for three days, and then the stone rolls away, and Jesus is alive, made new, beats sin, beats the grave, beats death, offers salvation for all of mankind. If you're an Office fan, you know Michael Scott. That's a Michael Scott headline. Like, it's a super long. Anybody, any Office fans? No? Any, like, a few of it? All right, okay. All right. Yeah, that's the longest headline you'll ever have in your life. Uh, but that's the Easter story. It's an incredible story to know, to witness, and actually be a part of even thousands of years later, and it's what makes Easter powerful. But written into the background of that story, written into the background of that story, there's a smaller character that I don't think, I think very easily you could pass by that character if you're not careful. And and, and we're going to read the account of this character in just a second. But I would say, man, the, the question why, why is this even in God's word comes to mind. And so I want to read the account of this character in Matthew 27, starting in verse 15. It says this. It says, now it was the governor's custom at the festival, which is the Passover festival, to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. There was a crowd there, much like this, all right? And, and, and he says, at the time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. He continues on. He says, for he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, I love this part, his wife sent him this message. So he sent him a text. Got a text from his wife. Okay. This is how I know the Bible's real. All right. I mean, this is exactly what would happen today. All right. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Pause for just a second. Because, like I said, this is how I know the Bible's real. It's basically she's going, 
you know, sending a text and saying, hey, I don't feel good about this. All right, I, don't, I, think, I think you need to get out of there, okay? And then he continues on. It says this. It says, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. So in the crowd, they're already conspiring against Jesus, against the Messiah. All right, it's, it's already, they've already passed it around saying, hey, when they ask, all right, this is a tradition, when they ask who they want to release, don't release the Messiah, the guy that calls him the Messiah, release Barabbas. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered, continued on, and he says, what shall I do then, this is Pilate, with, with Jesus who's called the Messiah? They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? It's still, at this point, no one really knows, is, that, has Jesus done anything wrong? Like, there's nothing, he's not done anything wrong at this point. So he goes, what has he, what has he done? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. And it keeps going. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. He said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. He said, it's your responsibility. And the crowd, they responded. They said, his blood is on us and on our children, which is a strange response, but okay. Then, he, then it says he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Handed him over to be crucified. So our extraordinary nobody that I just want to look at for a second is this man named Barabbas. So what, what do we know about Barabbas? We really only from this passage know two things. We only know two things. First of all, which is one of my favorite things about this passage, is that he was a well-known criminal. Like, dude was well-known for what he did. We don't know what he did, but everyone else knew what he did. All right? Notorious. Okay, so we know he was well-known. So what do we know from that? He broke the law, right? And the second thing we have is he got caught. He broke the law and he got caught. Those are the only two things actually from this passage we really know about Barabbas. Now, a little bit of paraphrasing of the context that we just read over, according to the custom of the time, which by the way, I think is probably pretty insane and hopefully they don't still do this. I don't know if they do this actually, um, is to release a criminal during the traditional Passover festival. So they line them up and go, we're going to release somebody just for no reason at all except for his tradition. Like, who do you want, you know? And they just let a, they just let a prisoner go. Uh, I just think that's kind of funny. And so what, so what happens is Barabbas, they, this plays out. Barabbas, a well-known criminal, is completely exonerated of his past misdemeanors and his felonies. I wonder what the rate of them coming back is. This just, just hit my brain. So, so they take the innocent Jesus through the city while he's flogged, spit on, beaten up, and crucified and we know the rest of the resurrection story, don't we? Three days later, empty tomb, just like he said there would be. Solidifying, solidifying who he was and what he's taught up to this point. But here's my question. Why didn't Jesus just go to the cross? Why is this story even in here? Why does Barabbas even make it? Like in this story, in, in the word of God. Why is the story something that we actually have to read through before Jesus goes to the cross? Why isn't it just like, okay, why? it kind of feels like Jesus is interrupted on his way to do the thing that he knew he was going to do. But we all know that Jesus doesn't get interrupted, right? Like he knew this was going to happen. He knew this was about to, uh, to take place. And so why is the story even in the Easter story? And why did it make it into God's word so that anyone that reads it will see the story? Well, I think the story of Barabbas has a lot to do with how we see the cross. I think it has a lot to do with how we look at the cross. Because the role Barabbas plays in the story of Easter magnifies three true statements about the cross. The first one is this. We see that the cross was Barabbas' cross. The cross was Barabbas' cross. Jesus was wrongfully accused, but Barabbas, however, was well known for his crimes. And if there wasn't a plot in the crowd against Jesus, then he probably would have been released and Barabbas would have went to the cross. 
Now, this is why this story is so, this part of the story is so important because we, we and we see the teaching of this in other passages. Paul writes about it a ton in his letters, uh, in the scriptures, and in God's word. But right before he actually goes to the cross, Jesus is giving an unmistakable lesson in this moment. He's showing everyone, but he's giving an unmistakable lesson of what is about to happen. Jesus stands there, innocent, perfect, without sin, right next to a person who was not blameless, who was guilty, who is broken and headed the wrong way in life, doesn't have a whole lot going for him, who needs help, who needs guidance, who's in desperate need for mercy and grace to come in and save him. Does that sound like anybody else? These are the two people standing in front one of them is going to get judgment on that day. One of them is going to hang on a cross. Does the, does the Barabbas guy sound like anybody you might know? And that kind of brings me to my second true statement about the cross is the cross was their cross. I'm talking about the people that were standing there watching what was happening. That the cross was their cross. Jesus wasn't just doing this for Barabbas. He's showing everyone in the crowd what's actually happening in this moment and what he came to do. That the one who knew no sin came and and, and is about to do this to pay for all sin. To pay for all sin. Which is incredible that this kind of grace is on the table for the people that are in front of him. That even though they literally are the people that got him crucified, conspired, lied to get him crucified, Jesus would switch places with any person that would put their hope and trust in him and surrender their life to him. He wants the crowd to see, yeah, that's their cross, but I'm taking it. That's, this is your cross. That's their cross, but I'm taking it. Their cross. If you want to switch places like I'm about to do in front of you with Barabbas, then we can do that. He says, if you just call on my name, surrender your life to me, that's your cross, but I'm going to take it. Now, I don't think this switch that's happening that Jesus is doing and showing us really sinks in until we take it personally. And to be able to say this next true statement about the cross, it just hits differently than the rest because I think I believe this all my heart it is so much easier to look at someone that might be down and out might be might be in a low place in life and go hey Jesus died for you Jesus loves you he's there for you it's I think it's easier to look at someone else and go he's for you he loves you he's inviting you into he's he wants to pour his grace out on you his mercy out on you and he wants to give you the power of the Holy Spirit he wants your faith to grow in the process so you can follow him and he wants a fulfilled life for you I think it's actually easier to say that than it is to say this next statement because the cross is not only Barabbas's and it's not only the people there in the crowd that are witnessing what's happening, but this cross was our cross. It was mine and it was yours. It was my cross. Rightfully. Do you feel that, how it hits differently? Because now all of a sudden the story of Barabbas gets a new light on it. All of a sudden, it gets very personal. You, you now know that the whole reason that a story about a well-known criminal getting a new cleaned-off rap sheet because of Jesus, why it gets into God's word is because it's not just the story of Barabbas. It's the story of you and me. That we are the well-known criminal standing next to the Messiah that's done nothing wrong. That literally you can plug yourself and I can plug myself right there on the, on the stage in front of the crowd when they're, when they're about to make the switch, when they're about to make the decision to, to let Barabbas go and to crucify Jesus. It's Barabbas' cross and yes, it was their cross in the crowd, but, but it just hits differently whenever I put myself in the, in the story and I go, that was my cross. That, that was my, the cross was there for, ready for me to drag it through the city. The, the people were ready for me to get beaten and disfigured and for my blood to spill out and for my body to break. The, the hole was dug for Johnny to take his cross and put it in the hole. And the people were waiting there with the nails and the hammers to put it in Johnny's wrists and in Johnny's ankles. And so that Johnny would hang on the cross until Johnny stopped breathing and Johnny died. And let me tell you something. When, and by the way, if you don't know my name, it's Johnny. 
Let me tell you something. When Johnny dies, it doesn't save anybody. It brings salvation to nobody. And Jesus looks at you and he looks at me and he goes, I know you deserve the cross. But I want to pour my mercy out on you and my grace out on you. And I'm going to make a switch. If you will just call on my name, if you will just surrender your life to me, he steps in and he goes, no, 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 no. If you will do that, I will take that cross for you. And I love, I love, I love that it says about Barabbas that he was a well-known criminal. I just think it's, it's funny, the, the details we don't have about Barabbas, but that's one that they were like, we need to make sure that gets in the book. That he was well known for the crimes that he committed. And the reason I love that, why do I love it? Because it's a reminder that the invitation for Jesus to be your Savior and take your cross is not for the perfect. It's not for the person that has it all together. He invites the thief, he invites the criminal, he invites the liar, the cheater, the hopeless, the depressed, the mess up, the screw up, the, the you can't, even if you wanted to, you can't even get up. He invites the lonely, the anxious, the broken, and he says, I know that cross is for you, but come on. The Easter story is here, and the Barabbas story is here, so that you know that a switch can be made by your heavenly Father, and it's because of mercy and grace that was poured out on that cross that day. So you may have a past and some brokenness and some pride and some mess ups, but he says, I'm willing to make a trade. I will take the cross you deserve if you, and you just put your whole life into my hands and watch me fulfill it and give you new life, a clean rap sheet. That's the invitation. That's the invitation. That's the, that's the grace on the table for anyone that will call on the name of Jesus and trust him with your life. And then what happens? So Jesus goes to the cross. He dies. Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, that's a tongue twister, says, I've got a family tomb. I've got a family grave that I think we've got some space in it. Let's give him a proper burial. So they take, they take his body and they put him into Joseph's tomb. Three days later, empty tomb. Come on, fulfilled prophecy, resurrected king. You can go ahead and stand up. We're about to enter into a time of worship. Resurrected king beats the cross, beats death, beats sin, and beats the grave, offering salvation to all people. And I do not want you to miss this part. Because this is the part where finally... On Easter Sunday, the Easter story might come to life in you. Because written into the Easter story, yes, he died. And yes, he was dead for three days. And yes, he came out of the grave completely unblemished and he's alive. And my goodness, I want to celebrate because he lives. But written into the story is the story of Barabbas. And the reason the story of Barabbas is written into the story of Jesus and the story of Easter is because you and I needed to look into the Easter story and we needed to find ourselves in it. We needed to find where am I in the Easter story. And God goes, you don't have to look very far. Because if you're wondering why Barabbas made it into the book, it's funny if you've been in this series for any length of time, because we've been talking about a lot of, a lot of unknown characters in the scriptures and, and, and gleaning from their life of how to live in godly ways. You're not going to catch that from Barabbas. The criminal, well known. If you're trying to find yourself in God's story, he goes, don't look very much further than Barabbas. And he goes, I'll make a trade. I'll take your cross. You, you give your life to me. You, say, you call on my name and say, I need you, Jesus, as my Savior. And you surrender your life to me. And he says, I will exchange it. I will take your cross. And then I will give you new life, a brand new life. And then you have the invitation given by the grace of God poured out through the Son of Jesus to come to the cross. But not to hang on the cross anymore, but to actually worship the one that beat the cross. And that's the invitation today. That's the grace that's poured out today. 
And then we're going to celebrate because guess what? He went to the cross and he went to the grave. And that stone was there and it was heavy and it was rolled right in front of that thing. But then it rolled away and there was nobody in there. There was nobody in there. Because we have a risen Savior, a resurrected King that lives and will never die and took your death and took your punishment of your sins into the grave. And guess what? When he came out, he left them back there. He left them back there. God, the Easter story is so powerful. But I know year in and year out, we can hear a story like this. And for some reason, it, we, maybe we've been to a few too many worship gatherings or a few too many church services that for some reason it does not just blow us away that the king of kings came down, A, B, took, gave his life for, for people that did not deserve it, and then C, he lives. He rose. He resurrected. The only one to ever to ever predict his own death, burial, resurrection, and pull it off in exactly the way that he predicted. And so, God, as we celebrate the fact that you are not dead, that you are alive, and because you are alive, we can have life. God, as we celebrate, I pray that the person right now that's dead at heart, that you actually have the ability, what the Scripture says, to exchange their heart of stone with a heart of flesh and illuminate them from the inside out and actually attach their story to your story of what you're wanting to do on earth and in this world, but not only just in this world, but inside of them. And it's only possible. It only is possible because you live, Jesus. So we are grateful for your life. We're grateful for your death. But we celebrate your life. We pray this in your name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's celebrate the fact that he lives, church. Come on.
Hey, I love it. I love it. Anybody else excited and grateful that God's still bring, making people that are mourning, giving them dancing? Come on. Anybody, anybody grateful that he's still bringing hope to the hopeless and he's still taking the broken and putting them back together? Man, this energy and this spirit of worship. Here's, here's, what, I, here's what I'm hoping for. Two things. My hope is that I, I hope that you're filled up. And that you're excited, but I hope you bring this same spirit of the resurrection power into your job tomorrow. I hope you bring it into your dorm room. I hope you bring it into your math class. I hope you bring it into the office. I hope you bring it into your school. I, I hope into your family. If you're driving kids to school, I hope this, this you've got the, you're guided by the resurrection power while you're behind the steering wheel, so that when people interact with you they get a glimpse of their heavenly father. And the second thing is, we're gonna bring the same spirit and the same energy of worship back next week. We're gonna bring it back next week. And I wanna invite you to that because we got three people that are taking their next step in baptism next week. And I'm so excited about that. I'm so excited about that. And here's the deal. Here's the deal. We're starting a brand new series next week. And if you've ever wrestled with the question that you have to be, or the idea that you have to be good enough before you come to your heavenly Father, you do not want to miss next week. You do not want to miss next week. Let me pray for you. God, thank you so much for being able to celebrate an empty tomb and a risen Savior. An uh, empty tomb and a risen Savior. Thank you for taking people that feel like they're at their lowest and you give them new life, reason to dance. And so, God, I pray for anybody, I pray for anyone online right now, God, that, that maybe their next step is a relationship with you, that it's something that they do not hesitate, and they step into that today. We love you, we love you, and thank you so much, because none of this happens without the Easter story. None of this happens without you, Jesus. We love you, we love you, we love you, Have, and amen and amen. Have a great Easter, church.